uh, one important statement I have to make. Uh, I do not represent any cloud provider that I will mention. Uh, I simply very, I'm simply very passionate about uh, serverless ideology and I want to spread this and I want to share this with you. So first of all, let's define, let's define the, uh, what do we mean by serverless? How many of you know what function as a service is? Yeah, like a lot. Uh, uh, actually, I was asking the same question uh, a month ago in PyCon US and uh, uh, realized that uh, um, they know much uh, less, my, uh, the attendees there are less familiar with uh, function as a service. So, uh, just a quick recap. Uh, function as a service is uh, when a cloud provider uh, uh, gives you the whole infrastructure for executing a single simple function. You just upload the code of your function to the provider and uh, uh, he gives you the API. You call this API, uh, behind the scenes there is a container spawned, your code is uploaded there and executed there. Uh, the response is returned to the caller. And this happens every time you call the function. Uh, or almost each time. Uh, let's have a quick look at uh, the providers. Uh, the, the big three providers are Microsoft Azure, Google and uh, AWS. They all have uh, this or that support for Python language uh, in uh, uh, function as a service. Uh, but you can see from the slide that uh, AWS has the longest history with uh, Python and uh, they support uh, more versions and uh, they have uh, a lot of uh, integrations and accumulated a lot of uh, uh, best practices of how to write serverless applications. Uh, so I will uh, mention several other services of AWS as well. Um, the second thing, if uh, you know uh, about, uh, uh, if you hear, hear the uh, serverless uh, uh, term, it's the framework. Uh, indeed, there is a web framework for uh, serverless functions that is called serverless. Uh, I will uh, describe it a little bit later. But this talk is not about the uh, framework. This is more about the way how you think or how you should think when you architect uh, serverless applications. And uh, uh, AWS that I mentioned earlier, uh, has a uh, great uh, uh, set of uh, best practices that they publish periodically uh, in a document called uh, well, well Architected Framework. Uh, there is a, a specific section there for serverless applications. I highly recommend uh, having a look. Uh, I'll have a link uh, at the end of my presentation. So have a look at, uh, let's have a look at the common scenarios uh, where serverless functions work great. And uh, actually, all the scenarios are uh, uh, dictated by the limitations that uh, serverless functions may have. And uh, let's uh, have a look at these limitations. First of all, uh, uh, we're living in a very dynamic era. The limitations that we have today, they will change next week, next month. Uh, so uh, you know, this is very flexible. But uh, for function as a service, uh, you usually uh, can control the uh, amount of CPU capacity that you provide for this uh, specific function, uh, memory and network bandwidth. Uh, but what's more important is the uh, limit of the execution time. Now, there is a maximum limit for execution time for serverless functions. And uh, uh, this, uh, bigs, uh, uh, this gives a much more impact on how you have to design your functions. You can't make long running functions and make, run them uh, serverless. Uh, but uh, there are ways how to overcome this uh, complication and uh, we'll see it uh, in a moment. So one of the uh, most common, I think, uh, scenarios for serverless functions is uh, the API. Uh, you just provide some HTTP endpoint for your uh, API. It may be your own web server, it may be uh, um, some gateway as a service. Uh, and uh, you map uh, specific endpoints of uh, uh, this API to uh, your functions. You can actually map even different methods to different functions. Those uh, work with uh, some persistent storage, some database, and uh, in this case you can enjoy uh, the beauty of uh, immediate uh, and uh, almost infinite scaling. Uh, so the number of uh, calls to your function 
doesn't really matter. It scales automatically, uh, and uh, if your traffic is spiky, you can uh, also uh, save money because you don't have to pre-provision any resources. Uh, another good thing is that uh, uh, serverless APIs can easily coexist with your existing web applications. For example, in my company, we use it uh, in a zillion places, uh, although the uh, core web server is uh, uh, running on a monolith flask, we have a lot of side services that uh, coexist with it and uh, work serverless. Um, <clears throat> based on the same pattern, uh, you can actually combining uh, you can actually combine a lot of APIs and build the whole web application based on it. Uh, just many different endpoints mapped to different functions, and uh, this will construct the whole web application. Uh, something is missing uh, for uh, static storage. Static uh, uh, content uh, should be distributed. Uh, uh, in this case, not through a web server, but uh, through uh, a content distribution network, some CDN from some object storage. All the cloud providers that I uh, mentioned, they have uh, services for that. So it's extremely easy. You just upload your files to some storage and uh, write the configuration of how to uh, map it to your uh, domain names, URLs. And uh, now this gives you really infinite scaling. This gives you very cheap uh, prices for distribution and uh, uh, most important, it's the super fast uh, content delivery time for the end users. Uh, web frameworks that I mentioned, uh, serverless is one of them, but there are several other ones. Uh, they all work more or less similarly and uh, you can uh, now think of uh, frameworks as a uh, mini mini Flask or mini Django for serverless functions. But uh, what's important that all of these have uh, uh, their own uh, built-in uh, mechanisms uh, to set up the environment required for infrastructure, required for the uh, functions to run, and also CI CD mechanisms also out of the box. AWS Chalice is the one uh, that uh, AWS uh, itself uh, maintains. Uh, another scenario is uh, stream processing. Uh, for uh, some event-driven workflows, uh, you can connect uh, serverless functions uh, to your uh, data pipeline and uh, process uh, the data directly from the pipeline. You can transform it in some way and, uh, let's say, save it to some permanent storage or you can uh, forward it to another stream or queue and uh, in this case, you care more not about the scalability, uh, but uh, about the simplicity of development. If uh, you have to do some very simple operation with your data, it's easy to design it uh, uh, in a small uh, uh, serverless uh, microservice, and then it saves a lot of development time. And <clears throat> uh, now comes the fun part. Uh, the scenarios that I described earlier, they run uh, synchronously. Uh, this means that the one who called the function waits for the response uh, from that function. But uh, actually, not, not all the functions have to return in values. Uh, sometimes they return uh, none values, and you don't really have to wait for that. The function may be uh, uh, working with some external storages, I don't know, upload some artifacts to external storages, or it may call other functions to continue the workflow, or they can uh, send some messages to queues. And uh, in this case, uh, you have to uh, uh, control the continuation of the workflow from the function itself. And uh, this is actually bad because uh, the functions uh, may fail. So uh, there is some orchestration required here. And uh, we'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, just just a small quick uh, overview of one more scenario. This is a very common scenario, just not with serverless functions. When you have to take some data from one source, transform it in some way periodically, and uh, send it to some destination. Uh, it's not common with serverless uh, because of the execution time limit that I mentioned. Uh, usually, uh, this is some uh, long-running uh, uh, tasks uh, having uh, uh, huge amounts of data to transform, 
and uh, we have to overcome the limit of uh, maximum execution time. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see how to do that. <clears throat> now speaking about orchestration. Uh, what should the orchestrator mechanism uh, really care about uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, speaking about uh, function as a service orchestration? First, failures. Everything fails and uh, uh, serverless functions also fail. So it's important to make uh, the uh, functions uh, to handle the payload uh, isolated from other parallel runs. And uh, it's also important that uh, the uh, workflow of a function will uh, be safe against duplicate calls of the same function. Because if the function at some point failed, we probably want to retry it, and probably even retry it several times. So the function, the logic of the function should be safe against duplicate calls. Uh, if the function works with something external, uh, like APIs, DBs, uh, you should care about throttling, because these services, any external services, always will throttle. Uh, Actually, well-architected services are supposed to throttle if uh, they are requested uh, too much because, uh, like uh, normal, it's actually a best practice of uh, API uh, design. Uh, services should not try to process enormous amounts of data. They should probably throttle and tell the client that uh, you should slow down, you should uh, like go drink some coffee, but uh, stop sending me so many requests at the moment. Uh, your functions uh, will probably wait uh, for this uh, during this throttling handling, but uh, you pay for the execution of the function, and uh, that's probably not good. So when uh, the orchestrator invokes functions concurrently, he should uh, uh, care about uh, he should respect the uh, uh, throttling of side services, and he should respect the health of the environment that the function operates with. Uh, this is, for example, the CPU loads of your database services, servers, or some uh, IOPS of your storages. Uh, the orchestrator should uh, uh, monitor these metrics and uh, make decisions based on them. Um, Unfortunately, there are no uh, out-of-the-box solutions uh, to solve all of these problems uh, in the market, but uh, there are some patterns. And State Machine is one of these recommended patterns. Uh, uh, let's have a look at the example. Uh, let's say we have uh, some uh, image processing. Uh, when we upload the image to some storage that is marked as source here in the diagram, you have uh, three different steps. You have to uh, call one worker that will um, <clears throat> that will uh, resize the image to some uh, optimal uh, uh, resolutions. Another one uh, that will uh, optimize the compression of the image, and uh, let's say another one that will uh, pass the image to some image recognition framework and uh, build a cloud of tags for that image. After that, after all these steps are uh, accomplished. The image is saved to some uh, database, and uh, uh, let's say it will become available in your content management system. So what's important here? It doesn't really matter uh, if you uh, upload uh, 10 images uh, per day or 10 images per second. Uh, this workflow, these steps of the workflow, are the same for the image, and they are isolated for a specific uh, image that we upload. Uh, you may configure differently the steps, how they run parallel, in parallel or one by one, whether you want to pass some artifacts between them, uh, for example, the already optimized image then resize and uh, vice versa. Uh, but all the same, uh, the workflow is isolated to a single run. And uh, there is a, a, a service uh, that provides this orchestration uh, pattern from AWS. Uh, does anybody use that one? Does anybody recognize it? It's called uh, Step Functions. AWS Step Functions is the uh, um, tool to uh, design workflows uh, of uh, this kind. Uh, but there could be another scenario when you have uh, a big payload. Do you remember the uh, processing of uh, huge amounts of data from one DB to another? And uh, this is when you probably uh, want to chunk your payload to uh, several parallel runs of your function. 
And uh, let's say we intuitively uh, uh, recognize that uh, this payload will be uh, chunked, should, we should chunk this specific uh, payload to, let's say, 1,000 uh, invocations, 1,000 uh, runs of the function. If we run all of them together, uh, we'll probably kill the API or uh, kill the storage uh, that we are writing to, and uh, we want to have uh, uh, some dynamic number of concurrent executions uh, of each specific worker at a specific time, and this should be dynamically uh, orchestrated. Uh, you can, of course, uh, write uh, some of this logic uh, in the uh, state machine that I said before. It's like a kind of virtual machine that uh, holds, uh, that keeps track of all the workers. But uh, we're talking serverless here, so uh, there is a serverless solution for that. And um, in my company, we, uh, a couple of years ago, made a complex of microservices to orchestrate other microservices. And about uh, several months ago, we uh, moved this project to open source. Uh, the beta version is now available in PyPI. It's called uh, SOSU for serverless orchestration of serverless workers. Um, and uh, we'll have a look uh, now at uh, some of the some of uh, the uh, architectural uh, solutions that we had there. But before, I want to show um, uh, some example. Uh, the worker is uh, the class uh, that is the, actually the function uh, that needs to be orchestrated. That's your uh, uh, business logic function. And uh, we can see uh, here that uh, the processor class is the uh, main uh, uh, class that uh, uh, contains the logic of the function. We inherit him from the SOSO worker to simplify the construction and uh, to use some already built-in helpers, some built-in components. Uh, this uh, example function will receive some uh, row uh, of data as a dictionary in the payload and save it to the database, DynamoDB database. In the configuration, we specify that we will work with DynamoDB, uh, and this will automatically initialize the uh, appropriate component, and we pass a specific config for that component. Of course, you can put uh, in this configuration also your configuration of your logic uh, that you will do with the uh, payload. Then the uh, call function is the actual router, that uh, receives the, uh, the uh, payload uh, as an event, and uh, then it um, uh, calls the appropriate, uh, uh, the appropriate uh, logic classes. In this case, this is just put to DB. The DynamoDB client will transform the dictionary uh, to DynamoDB syntax uh, automatically and uh, send it to the uh, database that we uh, described before in the configuration. And actually that's it. Uh, that's the whole function. Uh, the Lambda handler is just the entry point for the uh, serverless function that will just translate the payload that the function receives as JSON to, uh, to the processor. Uh, it's as simple as that. You can see that this is, uh, if you remove the comments and empty spaces, this will be 20 lines of code. The worker needs to be orchestrated, so let's have a look at the uh, uh, mechanisms for orchestration. Uh, the first one is the scheduler. Uh, the first essential component is the scheduler. Uh, the main goal of the scheduler is to transform one business, uh, one big business job to small tasks. It actually chunks uh, the, the task to, uh, chunks the job to smaller uh, tasks. It uh, can use built-in uh, chunking mechanisms, or uh, you can design your own uh, chunking mechanisms. And each task represents uh, uh, one single run of one single worker. Uh, the orchestrator uh, uh, function then uh, measures the uh, health that uh, I said uh, that the workers will depend on, and uh, based on that answers one single question. How many workers of each type should I invoke at this specific moment? 
and uh, actually invokes that number of workers, uh, just reading the appropriate tasks from the queue and uh, passing it to the workers. Uh, those will report then uh, to the queue once they finish uh, processing some tasks. And the last one is the scavenger essential. This one uh, monitors the status of the tasks, uh, retries the failed ones, if uh, some uh, tasks uh, fail, continue to fail, it may report to uh, some uh, alert system or send to some dead queue and uh, archive uh, the existing, uh, the successful tasks to the storage, uh, sorry, to the, um, to the archive database. Uh, I will skip several more slides about these details. Uh, now let's answer one big question. Why do we need uh, serverless? Why would we use serverless? Um, <clears throat> you probably have seen uh, these, uh, these uh, topics in several other presentations uh, that uh, this will increase the speed and this will lower the cost, but I'm speaking now about uh, the most valuable resource, about the developers. Um, in general, it's faster to uh, to design uh, serverless functions, then write monoliths. And uh, uh, you can save time and you can uh, lower your time to market for your projects or s simple tasks. And uh, this will uh, reduce, of course, costs and this will, what's more important, uh, make uh, your developers more happy. And uh, to make your developers happy, this is uh, another uh, story. Once your developers uh, gain uh, some uh, basic experience of how to work with uh, serverless functions, uh, they will uh, spend much less time debugging and it will be much easier to isolate uh, problems and uh, it will be much faster to solve these problems. This means less headache and uh, much more uh, motivation to do other great things. Uh, I think uh, that's it about the orchestration. So uh, most of the presentations uh, finished that we are hiring. So we are not hiring, we are an open source project and uh, we're looking for free contributors. So <laughs> have a look at uh, um, GitHub or read the docs. So, um, here are several links that, uh, to frameworks and tools that I mentioned. And uh, I really hope that uh, this talk inspired those of you who don't yet use serverless to, to give it a try, to start, uh, for example, for your next small task that you will have in your uh, home project, to try write it in serverless. It's really much more simple than, much more simpler than you could imagine. And uh, once you try, you will never uh, give it up. And uh, those of you who already use serverless uh, methodology, uh, let's uh, collaborate, let's share this knowledge and spread this knowledge. Thank you. And, uh